Well, hello, hello. All right, guys. So this is chapter one through three practice exam. I don't know, study guide, whatever you want to call it. Well, we're going to go through some stuff. Okay. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first question says, assign the hybridization to oxygen and nitrogen in the given compound. Remember, to assign hybridization, we're looking for electron groups. An electron group is a lone pair, a single bond, a double bond. Oops, I don't know why I drew a, drew a triple bond. A double bond or a triple bond. Those are all considered electron groups. All right, so you count them, and then we remember that there's one S, there's three Ps, and there's five Ds. Okay. Because we're usually talking about carbon, we don't usually go higher than sp3, but you know, you never know, so I might as well teach it to you. Before we get there, though, you have to know Lewis structures. So if you don't know Lewis structures, that is gen chem. you got to go back and make sure you have a strong understanding because you should recognize already that this nitrogen has two dots on it, right? Because valence minus sticks minus dots um, gives us an overall formal charge of zero. Notice there's no charges on these things. So remember, valence minus sticks minus dots. If there's no charge, this all is going to equal zero. Nitrogen is in the fifth column, therefore it has five valence. It currently has one, two, three sticks. And I have to therefore put two dots in order for it to be zero. So that's why I knew that had two dots. Oxygen, same thing, it has six valence minus two sticks, therefore it must need four dots, okay? All right, so once I've done that, I can go ahead and look at the hybridization. Again, it's each electron group, um, We'll determine the hybridization so one two three around the nitrogen so it's got an spp so that's therefore nitrogen is sp2 and the oxygen has one two three four groups around it and that's why this is we don't line up through the fourth or through the fourth um letter there and that would be sp3 and s and three p's okay the next question, rank in terms of boiling point. Remember we talked about boiling point being generally when we're looking at intermolecular forces, and we said if you come across things that have the same intermolecular forces, then um, if we come across something that has the same intermolecular forces, then chances are you're going to differ, therefore, to the mass, okay? So when I look at these, they all look neutral right off the bat. But remember, when we have first column, or even seventh column anions, but first column cations, like lithium, and potassium here, it makes means that these things have a charge. Remember, if they have a charge, they have ion dipole. Okay, so really, this one, and this kind of answers this question right here, has a positive charge, and there's a lithium hanging, or, or excuse me, has a negative charge, and there's a positive lithium hanging out with it. And then over here, we have the oxygen, remember this potassium would be the spectator and it's like hanging out over there with water, leaving oxygen with that negative charge, okay? So it said using the ionic compounds, which are those two, show how they dissociate in ions, there you go. So these both have ion dipole. They both have the strongest intermolecular forces. So if they both have the strongest intermolecular forces, um, remember then we defer to the mass. This one is more massive if you add it up. It's got one, two, three, four, five carbons and a phosphorus. This is way more massive and that is why this is your answer for the strongest, all right? Um, and in molecular forces. In other words, this one has also the highest boiling point, or it says one would be the lowest, so this would be the number four. This one would follow very quickly at a number three. So now we're just looking at these two and saying which one's going to have, um, which one's going to have the lowest? Well, there's two ways you could look at this. Um, one, hopefully you agree, if we went through, all of these have van der Waals, all of these have dipole, um, dipole, dipole. They're all polar molecules. These had ion dipole, but these are both polar, right? You've got this thing right there. We talked about that being an electrophile. This also has a slight pole going this way. Um, and then there's this nitrogen, which is slightly more, remember it goes C, N, cannot clean out fridge. Carbon and nitrogen are different. Nitrogen is a little more polar, so this has got some, it's a tiny, tinier dipole pulling this way toward the nitrogen, right? Okay, so this one has more dipole, but not only that, again, if they both have dipole, dipole, I'm just gonna denote it dip, dip, 
If they both have dip dip, then we go to the mass, and this one is definitely more massive. And that's why this would be your number two, and this would be one. This has the lowest amount of intermolecular forces between it, and therefore it's going to have um, a, the lowest boiling point. It has no problem boiling very quickly at a lower temperature. All right, use the following compounds to answer questions regarding A and B. Okay, so remember every, every turn, every end is a carbon with the appropriate amount of hydrogens on it. Okay, so for this one, we have a, a double bond right here. Remember carbon can have, carbon needs four bonds at the most. So here carbon already has two, therefore two of these must be from hydrogen, okay? So for A, the answer is two. For B, you have one bond here, one bond there, and two bonds there. So there are already one, two, three, four. There would be no hydrogens on there, but that's not the question. The question is hybridization. So it's got one, two, three things on it. If we go back up here, one, two, three would take us to an SP2. I guess I could answer the question, SP2. Okay, rank the bonds from shortest to longest. When we're looking at bonds, remember we, we did that demonstration in class where you have a person hold hands and then a person hold two hands and then you like cross legs, then you're really, really close. So, so when you have a three bond, a triple bond, you're really close. And this is a short bond. Okay. Um, but that's not necessarily what it's asking, right? It's pointing to all these single bonds. So how do we know? Well, we know also because we said that bond strength ha or bond length has to do with um, the S character, right? So if you have like an SP, it's going to be longer or shorter than like an SP3, which would be longer, okay? So now we can kind of see this carbon right here has one, two electron groups. This is an SP hybridized carbon. And then if you look at these two, I, and you could look at either side of this. So this is an SP going to an SP3 hybridized carbon. Here we have an S, it's got, don't forget that it has a hydrogen here. So it's got one, two, three. Here we have an SP2 going to this carbon right here, which would also have two hydrogens, which would be an SP3. And here we have an sp3 to an sp3. The sp3 to the sp3 is immediately longer, right? Remember, the more um, or the less s character it has, in other words, the more p's that are on there, the the longer it's going to be. Okay, and maybe that's probably the, I think that's probably an easier way to talk about it instead of s character. We'd just be like, dude, which one has the most p's? This has three and three. That's six. This one is therefore longer. This one has a total of five, therefore this one is medium, and this one only has four, this one is a shorter one. So this is shorter, this one's longer. All right, it says one is the shortest, so that's gonna be one, that's gonna be two, and that will be three as your final answers. All right, rank the acids in order of increasing strength, where one is the weakest and three is the strongest. Okay. One of the best things and one of the most important things to do in, in talking about acid or base strength, which we'll come across, is, is that acid strength or base strength has nothing to do with the acid itself. It has to do with its conjugate thing being, being, being better. So if, we have a, if we're talking about specifically an acid, if its conjugate base is really stable, then that means that the acid would be strong because it would want to give off an H in order to be in order to be stable. So let's let's do this. Let's first start here. Write the conjugate base of the previous acids. Okay. If we gave off this H, right? Remember, if something um, came, if we had some kind of lone pair of electrons and something came and took that H, remember these electrons would go onto that carbon, and we'd have that thing. Okay. Let's do it over here. If something came and took that H, those electrons could go onto that oxygen, and we would have that. Again, if these electrons go onto that oxygen, there were already a lone pair on there. Now, there's two lone pairs, and it, it, oxygen would be pretty happy, right? It's got a zero formal charge now. And then, over here, we have the nitrogen. If something came and took that H, whoosh, those electrons would go on that nitrogen, and you would have It already had a lone pair, so we can draw both lone pairs if you want. It would be that. It would have a negative charge. 
All right, so now we're just gonna look in terms of stability. So um, remember, if, if the thing can resonate, it's going to be more stable. Um, or if it's a zero formal charge, it's going to be more stable. So just looking at this, these, I can see that this one looks more stable immediately because it had no formal charge. That has a negative, that has a negative, this doesn't. If that's more stable once it gives off the H, then this would be a stronger acid, meaning it wants to give off the H because then it can become this thing. So this one is going to be stronger. I'm gonna put that at the three. Now it's between these two. Well, remember, um, really nitrogen doesn't, oxygen's generally okay with the negative. It's pretty electronegative. Um, nitrogen's kind of okay with the negative, but not really that much. Carbon's kind of okay, but not really that much. So neither of these two are that stable. So your next question is, okay, and they, and they both have charges on things. Your next question is, does this resonate? So can these electrons go up there? right? And stabilize it. And the truth is, yeah, they could. They could go up there, leaving this a positive charge down here. Those can come down here. You have a little more resonance. Anytime you have a, a double bond and a lone pair, things can resonate, okay? So this is going to be my number two. And this will be my number three, okay? So this is the least stable of them. It does not want to give off that H because if it did, it would create this state unstable thing, okay? Moving on. Okay. Right, isomers, resonance form, identical or no relationship. I wish I'd provided some more slightly different examples. Um, in fact, I'm even gonna, I'm gonna tweak this one right in front of you guys real quick just to, oh dang, no I can't because I just saw that it has an extra. So it went from a six to a five member ring. Okay, so never mind. We're just gonna go ahead and do this. All right, so what is the relationship between each pair, right? Isomer, resonance, identical, or no relationship? Okay, so remember, isomers, they're gonna have, and we only talked about constitutional isomers so far. These have the same number of atoms, same number of the same type of atoms, just in different order. different uh, conformations. That's why they're called conformational isomers. Okay. Resonance form, remember this is just electrons moving. But the atoms are still in the same order, right? If they're identical, then they're the same thing. Maybe sometimes they're just flipped around. And if there's no relationship, then there's no relationship whatsoever. They're not the same thing at all. All right, so let's go through each one of these. If I already count the number of carbons on this and the number of hydrogens, um, and, and, and I could, uh, I would come up with the fact that it has the same. Well, in fact, let's do it. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And then if you went and looked at all the hydrogens, here it's got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. So they're both C7. H14. Okay, so they're both C7H14. If they're both C7H14, but they look a little bit different. But the only thing um, that moves looks like it's the double bond, but it's not true. If you really look down at it, and in fact, maybe this would be better. Let's draw out the hydrogen. That has a hydrogen there, a hydrogen there, and a hydrogen there. But over here, if you were to look at it, there's a hydrogen there, two hydrogens here, and no hydrogens there, okay? So if you look at these two things, they are not the same. Like, they're not a resonance form, even though it might initially appear to be a resonance. Instead, they have the same C7H14, but they're different conformations of that C7H14. So I would call these isomers. Okay. Then we move on to this. Kind of a similar situation where they look very similar like maybe there's just electron placement that's different but if you count out the hydrogens that all has one this phenyl group right here and this has more than one i don't know why i just drew that but 
So this has way more stuff. These two are not identical at all. This has way more hydrogen, so they're not the same molecule at all, and these would have no relationship. Moving on, we get to this thing. Um, this, this does kind of irk me. Because again, it looks like it's the same thing, but if we were to draw this out, this whole thing has a negative charge. I put that those dots there because it would represent the negative. But if we were to draw this out, this whole thing has a negative one charge, and this whole thing has a positive charge, indicating a difference in the number of electrons or a difference in the number of hydrogens, most likely. So if this is a negative and that's positive, they can't possibly be the same. These also have no relationship. And last but not least, we get here. All right, I'm gonna, I, I think on the key, I put that these have no relationship, but I see it now. This is great, I'm so excited. Good, I wanted something that wasn't no relationship. I saw these both as six-membered rings at the beginning, but they're not. This is six and that's five. Do you see that? This is a pentagon and this is a hexagon. So when you count the total number of carbons, one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. They have the same number of carbons. Really quickly, like up here, you can see if things are the same if they look if they have the same number of carbons and they have the same number of double bonds. So here this has the same number of carbons, it has the same number of double bonds. Double bond to the oxygen, double bond to the carbon there. Therefore, these have um, therefore these are the same and these would be isomers. Cool. Okay. Now it says, draw three more resonance form from the following. You may use arrows to show the flow of electrons. Assign major or minor contributors if applicable. Okay, so a minor contributor would be like if you have um, a charge on the carbon. Carbons don't like charges, um, especially like if you have a negative charge on the carbon when you could have otherwise had a negative charge on an oxygen. But let's go ahead and, and walk through it. So <clears throat> it helps when you're doing resonance structures to draw the lone pairs out so you remember that they're there. Remember, when we have a lone pair and we have a double bond somewhere, things can resonate, okay? So let's, let's talk about what could resonate. For example, this double bond right here could go up there, okay? If you did that and you draw this with a two-way arrow like this, you would have an oxygen now with that many dots. It would go here, 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 here to an OH. The OH didn't change. But when you took this bond away, you left this thing, that carbon right there with a positive charge. And now that actually kind of helps, and, and this oxygen, by the way, would be negative. Remember, you always want them, this started out at zero, so therefore everything, all these structures we do better have an overall charge of zero. So we got a positive there and a negative there. Now, if we continue on, this positive charge is like, I'm not very happy. And this, this carbon's like, that's cool, dude. I'll come over here. Or this double bond's like, oh, that's cool. I'll come over here and save you, carbon. So it comes on over. Now we have this oxygen with a negative charge. Now we have a double bond there. So now the double bond moved from here to over here. And when that moved, we're left with a positive there. And now this positive carbon's like, help, I'm not so happy, come save me. And this oxygen's like, no worries, I will come save you. And these electrons come down there. So in this next one, again, we have the negative oxygen over here. To an oxygen, to a hydrogen. Oh no. Now we have a double bond here to that oxygen, which will leave the positive charge on that oxygen and the negative charge over here. And then we'd once again still have that double bond right there. Okay. So these would be all of our resonance structures. <clears throat> and the question was, Assign major or minor contributors if possible. Positive charges don't like to be on negative, on electronegative things. This would be a minor contributor because even though it's got this, it's not happy with the oxygen right there, with the, the positive on the, the O. Um, resonance structures, if you go back to Gen Chem and looking at what makes 
um, uh, the formal charge rules, what you'll see is that positive things uh, want to be on more electropositive things. So if you have something electronegative like oxygen, it's cool with having a negative, it doesn't want a positive. So these, these three would be much more likely to be contributors. Okay. And then using that information, if we take these three and we build them, it says draw a resonance hybrid. Well, we had a double bond. Let's, let's draw the whole thing real quick. So hopefully you agree no matter what, we had an O to an H and we had an O here, right? It was relative. It was really stable when it was here. This was this was definitely the major contributor. It was really stable when it was here, the double bond. But then the double bond also moved here. There was a double bond there. Okay, so there was a double bond here, there, and there. Right, and this would be the resonance hybrid. You just follow wherever the double bonds were. All right. Um. What are the formal charges of the labeled atom? Um, all lone pairs. That basically need it. Okay, so the formal charge, remember valence minus sticks minus dots. I feel like I should have started with this question because it would have saved some time in discussing things. But again, oxygen's number six on the periodic table in case you're missing what I'm saying. I'm saying if you find oxygen here, it's column one, two, three, four, five, six. <clears throat> so it's six valence. Minus how many sticks are touching it? There are two. Minus how many dots? Four. Um, some people are like, well, what about the one that it's touching? What about those? Like, just look at the oxygen itself. Ask yourself, what is touching that oxygen? There's only two sticks and four dots. It can't be anything else. And that's why this has an overall formal charge of zero. When we look at this nitrogen, um, we would, it says H2. What that means is that each Nitrogen has a hydrogen attached to it, right? So if we zoomed in, there's a nitrogen, here, I'll draw it better. There's a nitrogen to a hydrogen and a nitrogen to a hydrogen bond there. So there's two hydrogens on this thing. So when we go to figure out valence minus six and minus dots, there are five valences in the fifth column. There are one, two, three, four sticks touching it, and there are zero dots, giving this thing a positive one. So we would actually write a plus there if we were drawing organic structures. Then we get to this one, number of valence. There are six valence, there are three sticks, and there are two dots, giving a total of positive one. And then we get here. I drew these little dots here. The most, remember the most carbon can have is an octet. So there's still a hydrogen here. You don't see it, but it's there. So we need to know that. Um, so there's one, two, three, six, and two dots. So four minus two equals negative one. So this would have a negative one formal charge. And you would write a negative charge there. I'm trying to look for, I drew something out for a student the other day, just to kind of sh give them an idea. I've got a lot of stuff written on top of it. Okay. So anytime you have, um, a carbon with four bonds, it's got a zero formal charge. Nitrogen likes three bonds and two dots, that's a zero formal charge. And oxygen likes two bonds and four dots, that's a zero formal charge. Then we have a positive formal charge. If carbon only has three bonds, it must have a positive charge. If nitrogen has four bonds, it must have a positive charge. If oxygen has three bonds with two dots, it's gonna have a positive charge. And then negative charge, carbon, like that with a lone pair would have a negative nitrogen like this would have a negative and then oxygen which we should really know by now oxygen singly bonded it's got three lone pairs around it it must be negative so all these are the positive all these are zeros positive negative these are the really stable ones these are less stable particularly down here and those are um, slightly more stable because you have a negative <coughs> on an oxygen all right, but um, memorize, just memorize them. Just get used to using them because when you, when you get used to using them, you won't have to do valence minus six and minus dots. You'll look at this and say, oh, this carbon has an extra lone pair. If that carbon has an extra lone pair, boom, it must be negative. All right.
Show the products formed by Bronsted Lowry. Okay. So Bronsted Lowry acid base reactions, Bronsted Lowry, we're talking about hydrogen. Hydrogen's moving in Bronsted Lowry, okay? The Lewis acid base is when electrons are moving. So Bronsted Lowry is when hydrogen's moving. So if we were to redraw this. this thing, this phosphorus thing, it looks like this. It's got three hydrogens and it's got this positive charge right there. And we're reacting it with this S thing. If we draw the lone pairs, it looks like this. Okay. Your first question is gonna be, what's the acid and what's the base? Yes, both of them have hydrogen. They could both technically act as an acid. But remember the thing with the extra lone pairs, that's the one that acts as a base. So this is gonna be the base and this is gonna be the acid. Again, if it's a base, it's got that that or that. And this is true of Lewis bases as well. Okay, so this sulfur here is got these electrons and they're like, hey, what up hydrogen? And remember then the hydrogen electrons go onto that phosphorus. So this is gonna form, um, doo -doo -doo. I don't know why I just drew that. It would have an H on it now and it would be positive. Okay, but then the question is to show the equilibrium. So these would be an equilibrium, but the question is which direction is it going? Which direction um, does it prefer? And to determine that, we'd have to look at which one is, um, we have to go back to formal charge rules, essentially. So these, in this one, we can end up looking at our pKa kind of like we did in class, but when it comes to this, you have to look at formal charge rules to kind of determine which one it would be. So um, remember, electronegativity-wise, you have phosphorus and sulfur. Sulfur is more electronegative. If sulfur is more electronegative, that means sulfur wants a lower formal charge, meaning zero is great, but if it has to, it'll take negative. It does not want the positive. So over here, we have phosphorus. Phosphorus can handle a positive because it's less electronegative. And so that's what's going to ultimately determine which one is going to um, go in which direction. So it says show the equilibrium when it's going to go that direction. Okay, the equilibrium will go in that way because this is much more stable than that. Okay, so they make more of this. But what we did in class is a lot more like this one. So when, um, so we're gonna, just gonna go ahead and assume that these, the lone pair on this thing, this negative and the nitrogen takes on the hydrogen there. The hydrogen electrons go on there. We're left with do, 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 do. We're left with the lone pair there. And then we have this thing right here. which is you know, super happy and stable, but does it matter? Let's talk. So the pK of this, this is a, an H coming off of something with a double bond. You had to memorize that. That's about a 44, okay? This was the acid. First, remember, label the acid. That's the acid. If that's the acid over here, that means this thing's a conjugate base, meaning this thing is also the acid over here. So if you were to react it, remember this is equilibrium, it's going both ways. This would be the acid over here, as it's conjugate base or as it's conjugate acid of the base. Okay, so this is 44. If that's 44, this would be like 38 because you have an N to an H. So this would grab that H and it would go that direction, right? So your question is which one's stronger? They're both really kind of close. This would be a decent equilibrium reaction. Um, but overall, the stronger acid always wins. And if the strong acid wins, it's going to go over that direction. So you could draw the arrow that way at the bottom and a little one going that way. Okay. Well, y'all, I have a meeting, so I'm going to take off. Bye. All right, I'm back. That was a wonderful meeting. So much fun. Meetings are the best. No sarcasm whatsoever. So show how the Lewis acid and Lewis base form a Lewis adduct. An adduct is when you put two things together. But even if I didn't say that, you have a Lewis acid and a Lewis base and everything we did in class, those two things came together. Remember that a Lewis base is has the electrons. Just like a, just like a, a Bronsted-Lowry base, it's got 
a lone pair. It's got a double bond or it has a triple bond. And the Lewis acid has some sort of thing that's looking for electrons. So it's either going to be something with a positive charge, something with a really strong partial positive charge, or it's going to be something like uh, like a, a boron with three bonds or an aluminum with three bonds. It's something that can take an extra bond without breaking the octet rule. Okay, so given that, it says you must use arrows to show the flow of electrons. Okay, so right away, I see this has a positive. And when you look over there, it might not be not come naturally, but remember, uh, K is potassium, it's in the first column, and what that means is it's going to be a spectator ion, it's going to go away, leaving the sulfur with a negative charge. So this is a sulfur, it's got three lone pairs of electrons around it. And so what's going to happen is one of these lone pair of electrons is going to go to this positive thing and create a bond. So pretty much for the rest of organic chemistry, you'll be doing things like this, where you have to think about what this would look like when it goes over there. So the first thing that I like to do is draw one thing. So I drew this, and now I have a new bond. It goes up to that sulfur. So it catches the sulfur, and after that sulfur, I've got one, two, three carbons. So boom, boom, one, two, three carbons. Okay, you could have drawn it many, 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 many different ways, but this is... Um, could come together for me. So I see two lone pairs still on it, even after this third one formed a bond, so make, you, make sure you know that that has two lone pairs or that it'd be neutral charged. Another thing you wanna make sure is um, to make sure that all the charges on both sides add up. This over here had a negative and a positive. In other words, this right here started off as zero. Over here is zero as well. You could, if you wanted to, have a K plus, and that would also um, work just to remind yourself that the K plus was there. I don't care if you put it there or not. Um, so it also said Lew label the Lewis acid and base. We should have done that first. This is the base and this is the acid. Remember the base again is the one with those and the acid is the one accepting those things. All right, arrange the following in order of increasing boiling point. Okay, so kind of similar to one of the questions we already did. Um, this is intermolecular forces, so increasing boiling point, four being the highest. Right away I see this one. Um, this would be my, my four for sure. The reason it's a four, you got that sodium and an N, meaning this is a positive and this is a negative. Okay, so this is, has ion dipole. It's ionic, okay? Anything with ionic is going to be harder to boil because those intermolecular forces are holding it together. After that, I see... Um, this one and this one um, as being both polar, right? Here we got this polarity there. We have the polarity going this way. And I'm gonna stop it for one, All right, sorry. Back again, it's a busy day. So um, I think we started by, we were at saying these are both polar, right? So you have dipole, dipole, and dipole, and dipole on both. But this one's very special because hopefully you notice that it has an F to an H, an O to an H, or an N to an H, meaning it has hydrogen bonding. Okay, if this has hydrogen bonding, then this has to be the next highest boiling point. So ion dipole followed by hydrogen bonding. Then we can look at these two and say this one's non-polar, this one is polar, this has dipole dipole. And this one has um, just van der Waals. Okay, so this would be two and this would be one. This would have the lowest boiling point and this ion dipole would have the highest. All right, moving on. We're almost through. We're doing it. All right, dudes, draw a compound of the following. Um, really, honestly, you should just be able to do this and make up your own, um, but you could draw just about anything. Let's say, let's say my R group was like this. Okay, just like some kind of, of, of propyl um, addition to it. So an amide, if I do the pro propyl addition, an amide would be this. And then you could just, if you don't want to represent like you could draw hydrogens or you could draw whatever you want to. Um, sometimes lines work, or you could even put an R right here to represent it. Uh, carboxylic acid, if that's my R group, O to an OH, and there's just no other way to do this other than you guys have to just learn them. An S to an H would be my thiol, and an alkane would be like if I just added some other single bonded stuff. And an alkene is if you have double, alkyne is if you have triple. Okay. So it says, consider the difference, 
Consider the two isomers and their water solubilities. Explain why this is such a considerable difference. All right, so kind of going back to class, um, at the very end of class, we, we talked about a problem that had something that had a um, ion in it, and we said, yo, the thing with the ion in it, uh, in order for it to be ionic in general, it's going to need to be soluble in water. Right? So as soon as you put this thing in water, this sodium goes away, and you have a negative charge on that oxygen, right? So it, in order for it to even be an ion that it is, it has to be soluble in water. That's the only way that sodium goes away. So the, the difference between these two is this one is great, it's soluble. Or would be if it's just this. It's got this extra stuff over here, therefore it's got more than five carbon, so it makes it insoluble. But it would have hydrogen bonding if it were just this. Unfortunately, it's got all this extra greater than five carbons, right? Off to the left-hand side, making it therefore insoluble. But over here, we have the same thing, except for this is an ion. Um, what it can actually do inside water, even if this part over here isn't necessarily soluble, and this part is, um, is, is the water kind of forms, it can actually like form, if we have a ton of these molecules, they can actually form in like a circle or something like that, allowing it to, to dissolve a little bit better and protecting this insoluble spot right here. Okay, for the, this part number 14, identify the strongest acid of each set and explain why that acid is the strongest. Okay, so um, remember we talked about inductive effects, elemental effects, and the other things that affect how strong a um, how strong an acid is. This one I see elemental effects. I see everything looks the same except this is a sulfur and this is an oxygen. And on the periodic table, right, oxygen is more electronegative than sulfur. It's higher up and to the right than sulfur. Therefore, because this is more electronegative, it's holding on to the electrons more. Remember, we're looking at really this bond between an OH and an SH. This bond is is very polar, okay? And this one is not as polar. And because of that, the oxygen lets go of this hydrogen more easily because it's holding on to all the electrons, making this bond ultimately um, less strong with this one. Oxygen's totally cool, it's surrounded by electrons, it's very happy um, to give it off. And that's why this one's the strongest acid. It can give it off and its conjugate base is going to be um, much better. Its conjugate base is going to be stable, more stable than this one. All right, then we look at this one. Here we have these two things. They look very similar, except for this has the extra chlorine. We talked about this in terms of like somebody holding a kid's hand, right? So if a mom's holding their kid's hand here and they have a bunch and the mom is getting pulled a bunch this direction, it's easier for them to let off this kid's hand as opposed to this, which is like a less, less of a pull. The reason it's pulled this direction is because you have all those chlorines, right? So it's letting go of this hydrogen more easily and therefore this one is stronger. All right, now we get to this one. I really, 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 really like this question because it makes you think um, a couple different ways and a little bit backwards. So it says, identify the strongest base of each set and explain why that base is the strongest. Strongest base. So I missed that the first time I went to do this and I was like, the strongest acid. Anyway, so this is the strongest base. What makes something a strong base um, is if it's more stable, if it has a hydrogen, right? If, it, if, if it's con if it's conjugate acid um, is, if it's willing to give off an acid, right? So if we were to do these again, and then I just realized I should write something down for you guys. So I'm gonna just draw this like this and pretend it has an acid. And we're gonna draw this like this. And pretend it's an acid. Okay, so a strong base means it's gonna be a weak acid, right? So if we can find maybe the strongest acid, then the other answer is gonna be the answer. Um, so if you have a strong base, it must be therefore be a weak acid. So do you remember what makes a strong acid is elemental effects, inductive effects, and being able to resonate also. So of these two, only one of them can resonate. And that's this one. It can go from here to here, this can go from there to there, that can go from there to there. It, this whole thing can resonate 
And because this whole thing can resonate, this one is going to be a stronger acid because when it gives it off, this thing over here is going to be more stable. Okay. If it's more stable, why would it want to grab an H? Um, this one over here is less stable and therefore it wants to grab an H to make it more stable. And that's why this is your answer of the strongest base. Okay, and this one, um, there's a few different ways you can look at it, but again, let's, let's, let's do the conjugate real quick. So these are both bases, so they would take on an H, that would take on an H, and this would take on an H. And then I would just ask you which of these is the strongest. Well, um, there's, you could, you could look at it in terms of a little bit of an elemental effect, right? Or you could recognize that this is a carbon single bond to another carbon with a hydrogen. This is a pKa of 50. And this is the nitrogen. This has a pKa of 38. And you should have those memorized. If this is a pKa of 38, it means it's a stronger acid. If it's a stronger acid, it's a weak base. Therefore, this one, this one is a stronger acid. Therefore, it's a weaker base. Once it gives it off, weaker conjugate base. And that is why that one is the answer. Woo, did we make it through it? I oh, we made it through it. Okay, sorry for all the interruptions. And hope you guys have a great day. Bye.